Please reverse that. Okay. So, um, first thing, I'm going to apologize in that I am not reading from a paper. I have found that I absolutely cannot follow my own thoughts when trying to read from a paper, so I'm going to do this freestyle. Um, I hope that's all right with everybody, that I won't be pressing my nose into a piece of paper. The other thing, um, just a little outline of what we're going to do today. First, I'm going to have a little note for our sponsors. Um, then, uh, speak to you about what the ma this manuscript is itself. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the life and work of Fiore de Liberi, who this guy is. Um, I'll talk to you about this manuscript itself and what makes it so unique. And finally, I'll talk about the ongoing influence of this genre, which I uh, expect that really nobody has very much um, knowledge of the textbook genre. So I'll try to tie that into the greater historical picture. And Colin will, I hope, let me know if I start going over time. So just to, a bit of a word for, uh, word for my sponsors, I suppose that next I'll be advertising the Donna Kabat place. But I'm appearing for you here um, thanks to some very, very generous grants. I'm an admin professor. Um, we are losing an entire generation of scholarship in the United States in that we, in that we do not get travel funds, that um, my, my research and all of that really does me um, no good professionally and because of the job situation I'm unlikely to be getting a jo uh, job where that does me any good. So I actually crowdsource my appearance here, so, and this is also why I'm taping what I'm doing so that it can be shared with the wider public. So thank you to everybody, and this is of course also of interest to a very large community of people who are interested in these historical sources. Um, mostly fencers, hobbyists, people who are amateur uh, historians. And since this is of interest to a much wider group of people than the people in this room, this is why we're, we're taping this. So, normally, we think of translatio as movement, right? Movement from a sacred language to a vernacular language. Um, I took um, anybody, uh, I took Caro Zania as an example, from Greek to Latin, uh, movement from one place to another, uh, Ficino translating Plato, uh, or the Corpus Medica, or even the dissemination of esotericism, such as emblem books. But my big argument for manuscript three, um, for this manuscript, for 11269, is this actually goes against all of those axes. That what we have here is um, movement from a vernacular, a rather rough vernacular, to Latin, to a very literary Latin. Um, what's more, it's um, taking what is a physical art, and it is a practical art, and it's making it something literary. And furthermore, it's, by doing this, it's taking something that actually the purpose, Fury's original purpose in writing was to make what he was doing clearer, and here it's being obfuscated um, by a very literary Latin that not a lot of people would have been able to read. Um, what is this manuscript? I'm just going to grab my bottle of water so I don't get too dry. Um, well, this manuscript is... 44 parchment folios, as it survives. It's not very big, it's 18.8 centimeters by 12 and a half centimeters. Um, it was rebounded in the 17th century. Um, there is signs of water damage on the first page, on the signal page. Um, that I'll talk to you more about that page in a little bit. Most likely composed around 1420, certainly after 1410, um, before probably 1425 to tell from the, uh, to tell from the, uh, the style of the costumes there. And, um, the choir's about 10 pages, two guard pages. It was a property, it was inquired probably in Italy by Louis uh, Philippe Felix, the Marquis of Pontcharine, who was, of course, uh, Louis XIV's minister and also a great collector of books. His collection formed one of the bases for the Bibliothèque Nationale. Um, each page is split into two registers, and each shows a fighting technique, a combat technique, uh, both in top and on the bottom, accompanied by a Latin verse. And this is everything from combat on horseback to uh, fighting against self-defense against someone trying to stand with a dagger. And if you've seen other the other four manuscripts, uh, I'm sorry, the other three manuscripts of the Flower of Battle, it's instantly recognizable. These are just some sample pages, reproduced rather small, just to show you what we're talking about. That's the first page, the so-called signal. Excuse me, as you're speaking freely, would you mind if we doused the lights so we could see better what you're talking Absolutely about? Absolutely no problem, since I don't since I know what I'm talking about. You also uh, better? That's my better. Thank yeah, you. cool. I know what it looks like, you don't know what it looks like. 
like, so yeah. it's much easier. Um, so you can see here, and I'm going to reproduce some of these in larger, larger scale, of course. So um, just an idea of what you get when you look at the manuscript, just to give you a visual idea of the manuscript I'm talking about. Um, who was this guy? Who is Freddie Libera? I'm sorry, it's a bit washed out, it's a bit digitized. That's from the Getty version. But just to tell you who he was, uh, in very brief, he was a professional mercenary, a, prof uh, a professional soldier, I should say, uh, born from internal evidence in the manuscripts around 1350, um, fought in the Fruley and Civil War when, like many of the other city-states at the time, they kicked out their bishop. Um, Fruley at that time was, was really part of the empire. Um, later in life, he became very sought after to train men for combat in the barriers. These are, were earnest fights, though not always deadly. In fact, they weren't really very often deadly. But they became um, very much a statement of class and prowess. If you're a member of the military class, which is beginning to come under some pressure there, one way you demonstrate that you're a member of this class is that you fight other members of your class within the barriers. Um, one of the people, people he uh, trained was Galeazzo di Mantova, who was married to the Visconti family. He, a lot of the people who he trained were associated with the Visconti. And Galeazzo beat, actually twice, uh, Busico, uh, Jean de la Mer, uh, the, uh, who was the Marshal of France. So he was probably very well known in his own age, in his own time. Um, and the reason why he's associated with Deste, who he's most associated with, actually, is that um, the Getty manuscript is dedicated to, which is considered the finest today, is dedicated to Nicola III Deste. And he says that he composed it actually in February of 1409, would be 1410 by our calendar. Um, and the flower battle survives in four manuscripts. Three that were known, uh, four I found the one in Paris, and, <coughs> one, and the Paris one. There's also two lost manuscripts that we can tell from 16th, 16th century Estense Library catalogs, because these were in the Estense Library. Uh, the first one is uh, the one at the Getty, 47 uh, folio is the most complete, the most interesting artistically to us, at least, because it's drawn in sort of a freehand sketchy style, though still gilded, still very much a production. Um, the Morgan, which is less complete, it's in the Morgan Library. Uh, the Pisani Dosi, which uh, was published in 1903, I believe, by Novati, but that is in a private collection, no one has seen it since Novati has published it, and of course, the posthumous one in the Bibliothèque National. This is clearly a posthumous translation of the earlier work. So it does. It was done, you know, within some time of Fiore's death. Um, just moving on, right? Um, the Get the Getty is the most in depth. Um, I usually use this figure, which I'm sorry hasn't reproduced very well, to represent Fiore just when I'm talking about him biographically. Um, and most of what we know about him is given what he tells us himself in the biography he gives us in the prologues of two of the manuscripts, uh, the Getty and the Pisani Dosi, and including, very notably, he knew how to read, write, and draw, which means he's telling us that he's an educated person. I'll get the importance of that in a moment. And other information around him was found by Novati, uh, by Zanuto, who published a rather fanciful book on 1907 on, on um, uh, festivals um, uh, in his time and place. And also um, uh, Maximo Malpiero, who published an Italian edition of the Getty in 2006. So the Getty manuscript, uh, as I said, these manuscripts were probably preserved in the, in the Getty, uh, I'm sorry, in the Estense Library. And the Getty manuscript is dedicated to Nicolo III. Um, it's my belief either Fiore is trying to impress him as a patron, or perhaps these were diplomatic presents by the Visconti, because there's no record that anyone has found of Nicolo actually having paid any money to Fiore. Um, but, do I have time? No, I, that's fine, I'm just trying to read. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, and it's, we have to understand these books as part of the uh, Deste um, court milieu. Um, humans' consumption is part of their cultural style just as much as martial display is. That you have guys like Giovanni di Michel Savonarola in the court, you have uh, uh, Marino Veronese there, and of course, they found what's going to become the Death Day Library. They're going to um, become great collectors of 
books. Fiore explains, in his, he plays to this, he explains the relationship of fencing to literature. He says, to be a good fencer, you need books. But nobody, of course, except Galeazzo di Mancova had, had books. But you need books. Um, but, you know, this is patently ridiculous. You don't need books to learn how to fight. Um, in fact, write a fencing book is rather complicated. Because you need to know a lot besides fencing. You need to be literate. You need to be able to construct a book, that is to, to organize your thoughts into a book and to actually physically construct the book or have someone to do it for you. Um, you need to know not just the physical art you're teaching, fencing or whatever else it is, but also how to teach it. You need to, have to be able to set things forth one after another and you need to have an audience for this. And of course the big question is, is who is the audience for this book that I'm going to leave it hanging for a bit? Um, there are particular questions, though, of problems writing a fencing book. Because fencing is not something static. It's not something that's just a static... It's, it's not a pose. It's something that takes place in time, right? It's something that it develops as, an inter as, a, as, as a dialectic between two or more people. So you need to be able to show this. You need to have a technical vocabulary so that you can say exactly what's going on. You need to be able to say what this technique is. You need to have the organizing principles by which you're going to teach this. And then you need to take this thing that you do in real life, right? Teaching somebody fencing, teaching anyone a physical art, something you do in real life, and then you need to be able to put that into a static two-dimensional source. Um, which is possibly why we have no, even though we do have German fencing books of various subtypes, um, we don't have any Italian fencing books really contemporary of Fiori. And as you'll see, Fiori has got a very, very interesting scheme. And what we, what we really have to do is expand our idea here of what a text is if we're going to look at what the flower of battle is. It's not just a text, but it's an entire system for explaining movement. Um, and he uses quite a number of symbols to do this. Amongst these symbols, you have, I'm just going to skip sides right here so that I'm standing in front of these. He shows you what happens first. This is a wrestling technique. You've got a guy at the crown. The guy at the crown shows you the first thing, uh, the first thing to you do. You throw the guy's arms off, and then there's a guy who shows you a now, box. Some of you may want to get up closer and see. Can you all see you back there? This is a nice. I try to make them big. Yeah. This shows you a follow-up technique by the guy with the gilt garter. So first he does this, then he does this. And the other guy can do a counter technique, and he's depicted with a crown and a guard. Now, why do you call this fencing when it's all hand to hand? Um, yeah. Because exactly. it, it belongs. Because it's eventually being, going to become strictly fencing literature. It's sort of a mis, it is sort of a misnomer to call this fencing, because but remember then it was the art of defense, and it incorporated everything from every every sort of hand to hand combat, um, from horse battle, from from jousting all the way to to wrestling. So this is, you're stuck somewhere without your dagger, uh, or your sword, and how are you going to defend yourself? This is, you're at a peace conference and a guy tries to stab you. Which happened. There's actually an incident where, where this happened. So, the thing is, so this is sort of the visual pedagogy. There's, there's also captions, and only the Getty really has long, and long text with it. Everything else has these sort of very, very rough vernacular Couplets. I'll show you some of that. It's also very hypertextual because things refer back to each other. You go back and forth in the document to understand what he's talking about. And it's because of this that you can really have the techniques in any order. Uh, the Getty and the Pisani Dosi begin with wrestling first. The other two begin with horseback first, but it doesn't matter. But they all go in the same order. It either goes from short to shortest distance, which is wrestling to horseback, or horseback down to wrestling. Um, so it's complete internally referential hypertext combines image and text, you can read it in any order, and so it's, we can see this as a translatio from the physical realm to literary. And it also incorporates ideas, contemporary ideas of education, just as you learn to write by copying Latin letters, you're learning here to fight by, and the, the German for this genre is Fechtwork, which can mean either fencing, fencing or fighting, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it can, but you learn to fight by copying these patterns, just as you learn to write by copying letters, copying patterns, or you learn to draw by copying, copying your, master's, uh, your master's work. 
Just to show you what is contained in this very briefly, um, not of terrific importance to philologists, but interesting if you're interested in the study of historical martial arts. Um, the first recto is blank, the first verso is the signa, the, the, it's, a, um, it's a mnemonic sign for all the qualities you need to become a good fighter. And then we start with lances on horseback, then we start closing our distance, swords on horseback, wrestling on horseback. What to do if you are on foot and someone attacks you on horseback? Spear on foot. Um, techniques for defeating a guy at, uh, defeating a guy at the spear with two sticks, which we find in all these, all of them. This is a sort of quintessential furyism. Then we get the poleaxe, the knightly, the knightly, uh, the knightly pole weapon. Then we get sword in one hand, and then we get uh, more sword, sword and dagger. And this is where the choirs start to get a bit, a bit disordered. Probably when it was rebound in the seventeenth century. Um, we get dagger, which is how to defend yourself against someone trying to stab you. And then we find more sword in two hands, and this is probably a disorder, right? The, this is, we can see that's where the, uh, it's where choir ends. We go from dagger, and then we get to wrestling, then back into dagger, some of which are the techniques for, for use in armor. And then finally, on the last page, we get this epigraph telling us that Fiore, in fact, is calm down, no more. He is an expensive master. He has joined the choir invisible. Um, <clears throat> he's pining for the fjords, if there are fjords in Truly. Um, the difference now between the other manuscripts and this one, and here you can see a nice big picture, right, is that the trash talk, and this is Richard Gordowski, a fencing master I know, he describes essentially what the poetry is of the other versions as trash talk has been translated into metrical Latin, sophisticated Latin verse. The only other example of Latin in any of the Fiori work is in the introduction to the Pisani Ghost. Here is just an example, here is just one page, I chose this because this, these techniques are only found in the Pisani Ghost, and the techniques that he shows are found, in the other, are found in the other manuscripts, but again, you can kind of pick and choose which one you want to put into your manuscript. In this case, we um, just to, uh, for simplicity's sake, I just took um, a page where the two techniques are only found also in the Pisani Ducey manuscript. <coughs> and you can see this is pretty, pretty, you know, pretty sophisticated Latin. Tego te autorem petenta cuspide post tec medicans fidente animo facimus ad unguem. I uncover you so that I can strike, thrusting forward is my point. After this, with my spirit gritting its teeth for revenge, we will finish the work to perfection. Uh, Arbitror amenibus insis TV carpere lentis calidor manus hoc rapu to be calitur illi. I hear, uh, I see you hold your sword with an easy hand. A clever hand will seize it from you like this, right? This is, you know, it's, it's good quality poetry. It's not exactly literary matters, but uh, they, they've ennobled this. This is the first one as it's given the Pisani Dosi. Um, it's uh, in Frulian Dyer, right? In this way I uncover you the thrust to avenge myself of every injury and harm. For tal modo te discurruo per ferirte de punta, per vendegarmi de ti de omni in curia e onta. And then on the bottom, per lo modo che io oppressa la tua spada, toste de la mano de la avera cava. In this way I grip your sword quickly from your hand, it will have fallen. Basically, not really <coughs> high literary production there. It's just saying, it, it, and the others get worse. It's basically, and now I beat you into the ground and step on your face and hurt you a lot. Right? We're not talking here about high material. Right? What's more interesting is the system and the way it's the way it's put together. Right? And the fact that they're trying to show fighting in a manuscript. So this isn't really a translation. It's a transformation. Right? What's really important is that this thing that Fiore made has been translated into Latin, right? This whole system, this whole textual system has been translated into Latin. And it's not even a one-for-one -one copying, because, for instance, um, this, use, this in the other manuscripts, this is, this is the bastard cross position. Um, now it's the, it's the uh, leopard position. Another thing, these guys, should, these guys, they're showing follow-up techniques. They shouldn't have crowns. There's, there's no reason for them to have crowns in the system while they have crowns. Um, the transformation of the art is part of this. Here's that signal page. 
Um, let's compare, um, which one was this? I think this is the, this is the uh, Morgan signal. So this gives us all the attributes we need to be a good fighter. We've got an elephant with a cow for balance. We've got um, uh, that's a tiger, believe it or not, with an arrow for speed. We've got a lion with a heart for audacia. And then we've got the links with pair of dividers. Talk about measuring time, as you were. The well, dividers, we find, often find dividers for measuring time in a relative Aristotelian way in uh, fencing master portraits all the way through like the 17th century, and I think into the 18th. And we've got little verses explaining things a little bit more. Comparatively, <coughs> we're a lot plainer in the, Morgan, in the Morgan version, which is, however, the closest one-to-one -one in terms of the style of the Segno page. Um, uh, here, just as another example, this is uh, the four things you need to remember. This is very much medieval ideas of knowledge. Here are the four things that you need to know when defending yourself against the guy who's trying to stab you to death with the dagger. First thing, take his dagger away. He's holding a dagger. Second, there's no arms there, but he should be holding a pair of arms. Second thing, break his arms, as we say in Brooklyn. Uh, third thing, he's holding a key. Lock him up, right? Put him in a, in a hole, lock him. And then um, throw him down on the ground beneath you, right? And then, then throw him down on the ground beneath you. This is the Getty version. Right? Very nice art, very nice kind of freehand, nice use of shading, very lovely. Um, they probably would have liked this a lot better and thought this was higher class art because this is clearly like it's drawn from a pattern book. Let me get away, let me just get that caption away. And you've got your little, basically the same poetry um, on, these, on these banners as you have um, here in the, in the Getty version. Um, you notice also, in terms of symbology, that our masters are getting progressively older as they do this, showing the ongoing of time, right? First do this, then do this. Showing sort of the ages of man as a metaphor. So, this is you know, very rich symbology, very nifty. Notice also that they add ground in the Paris manuscript. Uh, Shades of Masaccio, perhaps. Um, not so, not considered by today's standards, great art, but certainly by their standards, maybe they would have thought this being more formalized, this together with the Latin, right, this would be better art in the 15th century. Um, other examples, the use of armor in this is completely rhetorical. Um, in the other manuscripts, they show armor when you're showing fighting in armor, right, when you're showing techniques for fighting in armor. Here, the guy showing Fiori's technique, right, the guy who wins, is always wearing armor. E um, even if it's an unarmored play, and the other guy isn't wearing armor. So the armor is solely a rhetorical trick. Another example of how it changes. Um, so these sorts of details mark the art as, this isn't illustration, the Getty is moving toward, is, is more illustrative. This is ideographical art. I want to stop you, I'll tell you why. Am I running? The material is so interesting. And I suspect that nobody here knows it. And I suspect a lot of you have questions about it. Do I have, am I, am I out of time? You have, well, you have a little more time, but I just want to prepare you. That can there'll, I, be a lot, I, there'll be a lot of questions. Can I skip to my conclusions? Yes, please. Okay. So, I mentioned, I already went over the slide, I mentioned this stuff. Um, the other, because I just have a couple more, a couple more slides to show you this by transformation. All means, by all means. The other thing, this is, a, um, this is the window. Post, post to Finestras, the window mm -hmm. position. Um, it's clearly marked as such in the script, but you know, um, people have said this is a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. They purposely, you see here, it's, he's holding the sword in front of his face. Here, they purposely drawn a hole in the sword so that you can still see the the, the, the you know, the, 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 the pretty face. So, just another another example there. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention. This is remember I mentioned the the footman against horseman. Well, in none of the other um, none of the other manuscripts is mentioned, but they transform it clearly to the Deste milieu because the matter of France and the Charlemagne epic, and uh, you know, Boyardo, I believe, was in the Deste court. It was part of that official Deste court propaganda. So they add Roland and um, Pulicanus to this. So even if, if Roland and Pulicanus were seeking me out with a sharp ashen spear, I, a footman, would lie in wait and then they would mess them up like this. So they add that, that bit of Deste court propaganda to this. Um, 
Another thing they do, this is the first mention of the idea of Aristotelian measurement of time, which is a subject way too complicated for me to get into here, but it's the first mention of the Aristotelian, um, the Aristotelian conception of time um, in an Italian fencing treatise, if you're interested in that. I just published an article on it in the Journal of the Northern Renaissance. It's free, it's online, you don't even have to go to JSTOR. Just Google Munshine uh, Journal of Northern Renaissance, you'll find it. Um, so ideas of science. Um, all these things are ways in which the, the much rougher, the much rougher uh, uh, versions have been changed. Right? So distinguished by the use of literary, though not humanist, Latin, because they're using vocabulary that is not Ciceronian, things like, especially for military equipment. There's no Latin, classical Latin word for stirrup. Um, this practical art is made courtly, even literary. This is a fixing, an ennoblement of Fury's work. It's a sort of reverse translatio. Uh, and it's, of course, also an additional step in, the, in this taking of a physical art and moving it to uh, a, a book. It's an expensive, prestigious book that speaks of the place of arms in the 15th century community court milieu. And it also incorporates ideas of science, courtly literature, etc., etc., etc. Um, one thing, though, I will note is that, this is the last slide, is that Florius, right, Fiori, is still given as the author, despite the many changes, which I think also brings up the idea of exactly what exactly is authorship in the late medieval context. Because this is clearly his thing, his system, his book, right, his hypertext work, transported into another milieu. Um, and then I can talk, um, you know what, I'm not even going to go into this slide. Take my word for it. There is a vast literature of fencing literature after this. Um, I have uh, written a great deal on it. If you're interested in that, talk to me afterwards, or just read one of my books. No, I think what we, you're perfectly timed, uh, and that's exactly the slide I hope to see, um, because this material is provocative and it's novel, and so uh, anyway, uh, I, I guess we should have lights, yeah. so we can see who's asking what. Um, and I, taking questions, by the way. I have millions of questions, but I'll shut up as I'm in a chair. <laughs> but I'm sure there are lots of people who do have questions, so please just fire away about this particular paper um, and any other papers. Perhaps some of the speakers would like yeah. to sit in the front door. But I, this material is, I must admit, totally new to me. So, uh, why don't we start with this paper? There are questions about it. Yes? Um, it's a lesser question than more suggestion. Uh, if you go back to uh, the senior page, uh, you mentioned the, the elephant briefly, and um, you um, said that it would relate to balance, so a quality a fighter would have to um, you know, have in order to be a good fighter. I would suggest that because, you know, it's not just an elephant, but a, a battle elephant, that it alludes to historic battles because um, the, the battle elephant is connected either with Alexander the Great or Eleazar, which, um, not, which would then, you know, offer more complex um, kind of um, background for a particular virtues of fighter or swordsman. <coughs> Well, I'm, I would be willing to, well, it's a battle elephant, yes. Um, they, there's one way to draw, you know, well, there's obviously many ways to draw an elephant in the Middle Ages. Um, and I think that that battle elephant was sort of stereotypical. It explicitly says what that elephant is for in the, cap, in, in the captions. Um, surely, yes, they were evoking some sorts of ideas of Alexander the Great. And um, also, if, to really understand it, you have to, you know, look in, look in Pliny, look in um, <coughs> any best, best areas. <coughs> the symbology in the segno is very, very rich and complex. Um, certainly the idea of it being related somehow to Alexander has occurred to me, but I can't really think of any, any way to do that that would be supported by, by the text. I'm, I'm more willing to say that this is basically that they're talking about having a good stance. First thing was, would be looking at the image, and then you would have to ask why would you draw an elephant with a tower on its back? So obviously it's not just about the elephant, because uh, if you have physiologists, as you know, bestiaries as you already mentioned, 
then you can just you know leave that out. The fact is that they put it in, so I would kind of you know uh, that would mean there is a connection, and that would also lead to you know to to the idea that maybe the other animals that were depicted not only kind of refer to balance and stuff like that, which might be very much uh, the case, but you know, kind of open uh, broader complexes that also relate to uh, qualities of a fighter. Do you I think you're, do you're right because there was a lynx at the top, yeah. and uh, in Italy the lincei were like the Academia de Lincei, they were believed to see in the dark. Right, because they, they're known nice for their quality, eyesight, quality. right. And it says, I'm the lynx who sees everything with their eyes. Yeah, exactly. If you want my opinion about the elephant, it's the, what, that, what that tower is there is that you're, when, you, when you're fighting or fencing or whatever, you, your lower body is your support, and your upper body, your upper body does the hitting and hurting, but your lower body needs to be stable. So the tower is the fighting platform. On top, the elephant is the legs. Right, the, the the tower is the rest of the body. That's what I what I think it is. Um, that's why I think they, they have that in there. Um, we people have read a lot into that. There have been papers uh, on this. Um, and but he's pretty explicit about what they're there. I mean, he says, "I'm the lynx who sees everything with the eyes. I'm you know, I am I am the tiger. I run faster than lightning." I mean, he's 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 really not that subtle. Um, Anyway, uh, anyone have other, other questions about this or any of the other papers? Mm? I actually had a question for Professor Kevin. Cool. That's okay, I'm sorry to... Yes. <laughs> All right, it's not the Ken Munchen show. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your paper. Thank you very much for all of your papers. But um, my question was about um, images of Kairos and how many you've seen in which Kairos is actually being seen. Are you speaking to me? Yes. yes. I have a problem with my oh, hearing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Why don't you come over here where I am? Let's see uh, if this is working. I'm not sure. Why don't you come right here where I am? 